So we are continuing our teaching on prayer this fall, and I hope you've been here in person and you've picked up just this little palm cross. Uh, if you didn't, you can order these from Amazon, and I'm encouraging during this teaching series, or as long as you want to, just carry it in your pocket, carry it in your purse. Every time you touch it, just be reminded that we are to live a lifetime and a lifestyle of prayer. So way back in 1924, there was a silent movie called Three Weeks, and it starred Conrad Nagel, one of the biggest stars of his day, and his love interest in the movie was a woman by the name of Eileen Pringle, and at one very moving scene, I remember it's a silent movie, he scoops her up and carries her into the bedroom. It's a romantic scene, and the placard after he picks her up, you know, she says something with her lips, and the placard says, you know, I love you, and I love you forever, something like that. But people who read lips have actually gone back and recreated what, what Eileen Pringle said to Conrad Nagel as she's picked up. In this romantic scene, she says, if you drop me, you expletive, I will break your neck. That's literally what she says. There's a lot of challenges with prayer. One of the challenges is just to admit that prayer is important for us. Because so often we get sucked into this idea of, of self-dependence, right? That it's important that we depend on God. Uh, another challenge of prayer is taking the time to do it, having the self-discipline to actually pray. But then probably the greatest challenge in prayer, once we decide it's important, and once we have the discipline to do it, is to make sure that our words and our heart match because sometimes we're saying things in prayer that don't really match what's going on in our heart. And sometimes we have these emotions in our heart that we don't know how to put into words. So that's why I want to come back to Jesus. Here in the next few weeks after today, we're going to go into other parts of the New Testament to talk about prayer. But, but we started with Jesus because he is uh, our Messiah. He's also our model for living a life of prayer. So if you kind of just notice the progression, the first week, Jesus made prayer a priority in his own life. And if he did that, so do we. Jesus gave us the basic building blocks of prayer through the model prayer of bringing our needs, turning our needs Godward, both past, present, and future. And Jesus taught parables. He told stories about prayer, about having a, a stubborn surrender to God. So before we go into the rest of the New Testament, I want to Stop one more time and, and look at Jesus' teaching on prayer, but this is going to be where Jesus wasn't really teaching in terms of intentionally having a group of disciples around him, but he's teaching by example in one of the most challenging times in his life. Because you'll remember that from the cross, the four Gospels record Jesus saying seven things from atop the cross as he is giving his life on our behalf. And what's interesting Three out of those seven times, Jesus is praying. Nearly half the recorded sayings of Jesus from the cross are prayers. Can I run through those just real quick? So Jesus starts out, first thing he says from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So Jesus actually is praying for others and about others from the cross. Then after saying something to the criminal and after saying something to his mother, Jesus again turns his attention to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in his first prayer, Jesus is talking to others. Now he's talking to God about God. And Jesus then says two more things. I thirst and it is finished. And the last thing he says, his last words from the cross, his last words before the resurrection was a prayer. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So do you see, from atop the cross, Jesus is praying for others. He's praying to God about God, and he's also praying for himself. Uh, so I, I have in my possession here a deck of cards. Actually, this is a, a retired deck or a canceled deck of cards from a casino. Don't ask me where I got them. Really, don't ask me where I got them. Oh, from River Spirit Casino. So if you've ever played cards before, and I know you never have, right? What you may not know is that the kings in the deck of cards all represent a different king throughout history. So the king of spades is David. Uh, the king of clubs <laughs> nearly dropped the cards. I never hold cards. I don't know how to handle cards. The king of clubs is Alexander the Great. Uh, king of hearts, that's Charlemagne. 
and the king of diamonds represents Julius Caesar. All the kings represent, uh, oh, and I've got an ace. I don't know what that means, but I think I just won. All the kings in a deck of cards represent a different king. And what I also notice, if you look carefully, is each one of the kings is carrying a weapon in their picture. It makes you want to look at a deck of cards now, doesn't it? So think about this. Jesus is our king, and he carries with them the resource, the weapon of prayer. It's important to see how he wielded that prayer from atop the cross. When he needed protection the most, he found his protection his offense and his defense in prayer. So what I want to do is look at these three prayers one at a time and let Jesus, our Messiah, also be our model for prayer. So here's the first one. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. I want you to think about this in terms of praying for others. Jesus did not just pray for a person's surface needs. He prayed for the deepest need in their life. Jesus could have prayed that these soldiers would stop abusing him. Jesus could have prayed that the religious people would stop hating him. But he didn't pray for those surface things. He prayed for the deepest part of another person. He prayed for their forgiveness. In other words, and by the way, I think that Christians today, we need to rediscover the art of praying that we would forgive others and praying over forgiveness for others. Christians have given in to the rest of culture and we start hating everyone that we disagree with or that we don't like. I think as Christians today, we need to rediscover the art and the prayer of forgiveness, right? Jesus prays for the deepest needs of a person. Why? Because he's more concerned for their souls than he is concerned about their actions. I want you to think about that for just a moment because that might be the very thing that will help you pray forgiveness over someone else, that Jesus cared more about a person's soul than he cared about their immediate actions. He also cared more about his example than he was his own feelings. Jesus knew intuitively that at this moment atop the cross, he was praying as an example to us, his disciples. And so instead of being sucked into his own emotions, he was concerned about being an example to his disciples, to us. And in fact, it would be Peter, the first Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7, when he is being stoned to death, he picks up on these very same words of Jesus. As Jesus taught us to pray, so Stephen prayed, so we need to pray. Father, forgive them for they don't understand what they're doing. As followers of Jesus, as we pray for others, we need to pray for their deepest needs. We also need to rediscover the art of forgiveness. We need to be more concerned with people's souls than we are their actions. And we too need to remember that we are being an example to others by what we do or what we don't do. We can be sucked into our own emotions or say that I will be an example of what it means to practice forgiveness. Maybe when you feel this cross in your pocket, you'll start praying for the very people you've been trained to hate. And Jesus is now telling you and teaching you to do something different. It was C.S. Lewis uh, years ago. He wrote this little piece. He was, uh, I forget what book he was writing, but he, he writes about forgiveness. He said, last week while at prayer, I suddenly discovered or felt as I did that I had really forgiven somebody I've been trying to forgive for 30 years trying and praying that I might. 30 years it took him to finally get to that place where he could honestly say he's forgiven somebody else. And if that sounds discouraging, just think how long it would take us to forgive somebody if it weren't for prayer. And when Jesus teaches, hey, you know, you need to forgive someone not seven times, but 77 times, maybe that forgiving multiple times is not for different sins. Maybe we have to forgive the same sin over and over and over and over and over and over and over over and over again until we finally let it go. Father, forgive them. Let's pray for the deepest needs of other people. Second prayer from atop the cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this is one of the most challenging and profound prayers that Jesus prays. He's actually quoting Psalm 22. This is uh, kind of a a, a grief prayer that D- Jesus picks up on from Psalm 22. He probably prayed it his whole life. Now he prays it here from atop the cross. And it's one of the few times, excuse me, 
It's the only time that Jesus is reported to have prayed in the Bible where he did not refer to God as his Father. And so some theologians have glommed onto this, and they said, well, at this moment, when the sin of the world was placed on Jesus, God, who can't be around sin, removed himself from the situation, and Jesus knew that God had left, and he felt abandoned by God because he was abandoned by God. I hate to disagree with smart people, but I don't believe God fled the scene from the crucifix. I think God was right there at a moment because certainly sin does separate us from God. However, obedience. Jesus was giving himself in full obedience to the Father's will, and I don't think the Father would have wanted to be anywhere else than where he was right there at Golgotha. Now, why am I certain that God was there? And, and by the way, if God was there, why did Jesus pray this prayer? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God wasn't absent, but Jesus couldn't sense God's presence. He wasn't aware of God's presence. He was so overcome by the sin that was put on him that even though God was there, Jesus couldn't feel him. So why am I so convinced that God was right here? Because Jesus is still talking to him. I, I, I know I'm a pretty simple person and kind of simple ideas here, but Jesus wasn't talking to somebody who wasn't there. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The challenge, as we talk to God about God, is to appreciate and to enjoy when we can experience his presence, but also acknowledge and endure when we don't feel his presence. My encouragement is when you know God is present, you know he's there, enjoy it, praise him. And when you feel the absence of God, it's not that God has left, it's that you have just lost the awareness of God's presence. Tell him that too. I was listening to a podcast this week. It's kind of a, just a real eclectic podcast, the kind of trivia that I like. And uh, it was, it's a podcast on sitcoms and kind of the history of sitcoms, where they come from and all of that. So they were talking about... Um, a term used in sitcoms, you know there's typically three walls in a situational comedy. There's the back wall, the two side walls, and the television where we're watching from is the fourth wall. Okay, it's invisible and we're kind of looking through that wall, seeing the lives of other people. I just think about the Big Bang Theory because I enjoy that, that sitcom, right? So, so we're looking through the fourth wall. But there comes a time every now and then where an actor will, it's called breaking through the fourth wall, that they'll actually turn to the camera, and this isn't a sitcom, but you remember Ferris Bueller when he turns to the camera and he says, you know, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop every once in a while, you might miss it. He's breaking through the fourth wall. There's something going on here, and he turns to us and he speaks to us, and there's something engaging about that, that the character is actually talking directly to us. When it comes to God, we need to break through that fourth wall and talk to God about God. There are a few things more authentic and engaging than telling God what you really think about him right here, right now. And I've said this before, I don't think you can say to anything, you can't say anything to God that's long-term going to damage your relationship with him. He knows it's in our hearts, let's engage him anyway. Jesus here feels that freedom. So Jesus talks to God about other people. Father, forgive them. He talks to God about God. And then what Jesus does is he talks to God about himself. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So um, this summer went to Arlington National Cemetery. I've been there before. But... For some reason, I've never taken the time just to walk among the graves of Arlington National Cemetery. Very moving. And I stumbled upon the grave of Mary Todd Lincoln and Robert Todd Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln is buried in uh, Springfield, Illinois. But I didn't know this, that his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and oldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, are buried, buried there in Arlington National. In fact, they share a tomb together. Uh, and I started thinking about, and I went back and looked this up to confirm this was true, but Robert Todd Lincoln was actually in the presence of three presidents when they were assassinated. Of course, he was there in, in Washington, D.C. in 1865 when his father was assassinated. 
In 1881, he was an eyewitness to President Garfield's assassination in the uh, Washington 6th Street train station. And in 1901, he was at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, when McKinley was shot. Three presidents, he was in their presence every time they were assassinated. You want another little interesting twist here. Robert Todd Lincoln was almost killed as a young man at a train station. He fell onto the tracks. Somebody rescued him and pulled him back to safety. You know who that person was? He was a man by the name of Edwin Booth, who was an actor. And his brother was uh, Wilkes Booth, who tried to kill Lincoln. Why did I just blank out on uh, Wilkes Booth? You know who I'm talking about, the guy who shot Lincoln. Boy, I, my mind isn't perfect, right? John Wilkes Booth, there it is. You never know what destiny is going to do. Sometimes we're around death more than we like to be. Sometimes we're rescued in ways that we can't anticipate. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We pray to God about our own lives. And we commit our way to him. Jesus can be trusted with your life. How do I know that? Because Jesus gave his life for you. So when we post this video to YouTube, uh, we post it before Sunday and we post it before we gather for worship. So I know I can watch the numbers and see that a lot of people watch this even before Sunday worship, which will be October 2nd. Let me encourage you, if, if you're continuing to watch from home, to get out, to come downtown, because at this point in the message, when we talk about Jesus being worthy to give our lives to, um, he gave his life for us. And we're going to take communion together. And there's some of you that are isolating still at home, and you've been isolated for far too long. That isolation is not good for you. Can I invite you to communion? To commune with the God of the universe through bread and cup. And also to commune with the body of Christ as we await Jesus and his return. So this is how we pray. And as you carry this little cross in your pocket, maybe you start praying for people's deepest needs around you. Maybe you don't even know what those deepest needs are. But God, I don't know what that person's deepest needs are, but I pray for them nonetheless. You know what they are. Maybe you talk to God about God, expressing your biggest concerns about him, his presence, his absence, and maybe you pray for yourself too. And whatever else you pray, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. By the way, that's a pretty good prayer to pray at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. That's giving yourself back to God. You might not know this, but um, the world's smallest city is smaller than the world's largest buildings. Vatican City, for some of you who've been there, it's about... Uh, Five million square feet, right? The Pentagon is about six million square feet. So, so the world's biggest buildings are larger than the world's smallest cities. These prayers that Jesus prays, they're small words. But they cover a lot of ground. Father, forgive them. My God, my God. And into your hands I commit my spirit. Small words covering a lot of ground as Jesus is our Messiah and our model. Father, I pray for every person who hears this simple message that we would engage a lifetime and a lifestyle of prayer. And it doesn't mean adding one more thing to our schedule. It means that everything on our schedule becomes an opportunity for prayer as we meet others, as we encounter you, as we deal with ourselves. May we turn our need Godward. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may God grant you peace, now and forever. Amen.